So we are live and I just want to uh, thank everyone for, for joining us today. My name is Maria Belcher. I'm the executive director at Festival Charleston and I'd like to uh, thank you all for, for joining us as a part of Festival Virtual this summer. We are on day eight of 15 for virtual art, music, theater, dance, uh, family fun, and so much more. The, the full schedule of events can be found on festivalcharleston.com. And today's event is the uh, roundtable, the, the author's roundtable. It's a definitely a, a favorite event uh, as a part of Festival Charleston. And we're so thankful to Mark Harshman and to all of our, our poets uh, today that were so willing and, and able to make this virtual pivot, um, even though it is a, a bit unorthodox. Um, but we're so thankful that, that they could uh, make the time to be with us. And the Authors Roundtable aims to showcase uh, regional authors and also provide an opportunity for community members to learn more about these authors, their works, their processes, uh, inspiration. And it is uh, curated each year by uh, West Virginia Poet Laureate, Mr. Mark Harshman. Um, and we will have a, a question and answer portion at the end, but during the readings, uh, please feel free to put any of your questions in the comments box. Uh, I'll be uh, looking for those and, and taking note, but we will be holding the, the audience Q&A until the uh, end portion of the event. But that is that is enough about me. Uh, I will now uh, turn it over to uh, Mark Harshman with a, with a quick mention uh, and a thank you to the West Virginia Humanities Council, uh, a state affiliate of the um, West Virginia Humanities Council for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, this project is being presented with financial assistance from them and we, we truly appreciate their continued support uh, of this event. And uh, Mark, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Maria. Let me join Maria in welcoming all of you in virtual reality to our Authors Roundtable. Um, I'm going to step out of the way as quickly as I can. I will introduce each of the poets and they'll be reading uh, from their work for approximately 15 minutes. And then after that, um, I've got some questions that uh, about, you know, where different ones of us draw our inspiration, what some of our work habits are like, mm -hmm. other questions as well. And then hopefully you folks um, out there will be joining us with your, own, with your own questions. So let's begin. And to begin, I'd like to uh, welcome first uh, the distinguished and award-winning poet, Mar Mary Barbara Moore. She's an astounding writer and teacher. Mary has published several major collections and won four poetry awards in just the past four years. Her life's work has been hailed by well-respected poets throughout America. Her latest poetry collection, Amanda and the Mansoul, was selected by Dorian Lowe for the 2017 Emrys Award. Uh, other poems have been published in numerous journals uh, throughout the country. Jerry LaFemina has written of Moore's work that she captures the lyric moment with precision and careful prosody and loves language as much for its malleability as for its sensuality. <laughs> Myself, I find it a startling achievement to read a poet whose work is so clearly unafraid of taking risks and having fun, and yet who never leaves me without access to not only the pleasure but to the meaning, a meaning that resonates with what it means to be human in this mad world that draws us also to earth, her words, the stones of worry in our pockets, the weight of darkness in our shoes. Mary Barbara Moore. <laughs> wow, what an intro. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to start reading a couple of uh, poems from my collection, Flicker. Uh, and the first one is for my dad, it's Father's Day. And it's kind of based on this picture. <clears throat> Family's Fables. In my father's World War II photo, he's sharp, air corpsman in khaki, chicory, blue eyes, innocent as shrugs, bluff back slapper, talker and joker. He flew North Africa in a tail gunner's turret, a short man and choleric, whose blood pressure rose so high, his arteries thickened like cork. 
he must have cursed and prayed in the sky, worried, smoked and sweated, firing his bastard heart out, tracers fat like wasps. Kinless, he devised history, it's like ballads. His flame-headed Irish mother sang vaudeville in one fiction, and in the dressing room mirror, combed out her arm length hair as he watched and adored. The truth revealed at 60 when he went under ether's mask. She worked saloons, singer, and two bit whore, jilted, left with child by a day laborer. A client killed her with an ice pick. In another life, his strict old country grandmother raised him Catholic, but irreverent. He ate fish, but shirked the holy days. And Grown ran a speakeasy on Chicago's green east side, where he and some hapless partner once hid Bugs Moran from Al Capone. Truths may lie among these venial fictions. Red-blooded, all-American, my father juggled lives like balloons of blab, daydream in his flying bubble, selves, families, fables, no one left to testify or witness. <clears throat> so these are really happy poems on my mother's suicide. Paint of talk and sulk, saint of don't and won't. You never quite forgot, never forfeited worry, the gnaw you owned. You died of null and none, hip bone broken, woman bowl broken. You honed appetite to none, burrowed into nowhere's nothing bed. Now you walk at night, not in a white gown, dark hair, a girl of worry, pale hands ringing, fingers ringed for bow and bow, oh for zero, oh for no. I held your ashes, silk and grit, shadow of wish and flesh, and still I jilt you who taught me not too well. And will I, nil I follow you, not hunger without a home, goner? You got me in the end, your sea teal eyes, your worry dice, the swollen knuckle bones. I wear your musk, you're never quite, your mull and nicks. This is a pretty new poem, as you'll be able to tell from the content. Anonymous thinks of erasure. My tongue worries a molar while I doodle the dream catcher that webs my window, fetish against bad vibes and spirits other than gin. I look up. The overcast dulls the tin cigar stovepipe next roof over, but doesn't erase it. Though that verb erase keeps rubbing my mind right or wrong these days. The wind says, hush, real loud, a form of erasure, or maybe it's wash, wash. A compulsive hash 
in rehash or a mother's. I wish my daughter whose immune's not well will wash the viruses away. The roof shingles next door look like sideways book back shelved on a slant, their author anonymous, her name weathered away. I studied her once. Now I'm building bed springs, staircase spirals, a tornado of zeros until I bump into the pages end or the days. It's not a landscape or even a word did I do. So what if you race rubs them out? They dervish, pirouette, spiral, and old phone code cord, be twisky, joining daughter and mother whose talk rings around the rosy plague sign. She used to sing and whirl till vertigo and all fall down. May she be well. May dancing's blur be her only erasure. May she be and be and be. Something was about to become itself, we knew. We become the TV nature show in which rhododendrons feature the bud looking like a pine cone, its oval pointing upward, the bracts and petals tight. It unfolds in slow-mo, the whole floppy magenta cup, layers of lips, cusps, and rims, or we think our daughter verging on adolescence, but veer away. The television soon spills the protests. The room seethes and writhes. The tears, the gas induces, will take days to purge from the rugs. In the June heat, their feet steam and make our feet like anvils. And the young woman, our daughter, slips into it through the gaps and gasps and clouds the tear bus mounds. And she joins the sea and is carried down a street in Cincinnati, San Diego, Cleveland. We find we are afraid, but our chests swell. We breathe wider. What was made of her still wasn't final and had little to do with our befuddle and meddle. Sometimes our daughter visits, her long hair braided and wringing her head, an aura of her. She was no longer who we intended, but more brilliant and wild like Appalachian rhododendrons. She enters the house like waves of energy, muscular, swelling, unpredictable. The little rooms of our eyes cannot contain her. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary very much. It was a pleasure to hear you read just now, those <laughs> wonderful poems. It's such a treat uh, to next welcome Elizabeth Savage uh, to join us this afternoon. Um, Elizabeth is a superb poet whose intricate and subtle poems elevate mystery to a level of transcendence worthy of comparison with the succinct charms of Loreen Niedeker, whose poems I know that we both treasure. Her books include a trio of full-length collections from Furniture Press, as well as another trio of chapbooks. 
Elizabeth serves as professor of English at Fairmont State University. And more importantly to me is the poetry editor of Kestrel Magazine. For my mind, possibly the finest literary magazine in our region and certainly one of the finest magazines functioning in America right now. So uh, a real pleasure. I want you all to welcome Elizabeth Savage. Thank you, Mark. That was, that was so nice. And Mary, that was a beautiful reading. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna begin just reading a couple of introductory poems from my book, Idyllied, uh, which is uh, my effort to look at West Virginia and Fairmont where I live in specifically through the lens of Homer's The Iliad. Um, my husband is a classicist and this is a, a text dear to him. Uh, and it was a way of, of moving past some, some barriers I had with, with literary tropes, but also to see a place where I, that I loved, but it was becoming very familiar to me in a different way. Path. Everywhere there is a cushion, a spacing invitation, an arm's breadth exit ramp, caution thrown wide to race. Anywhere there is an angle measuring a sheet of sky, somewhere a limit, elsewhere fine strokes denote a wind of suspension, of trespassing intention. Thorns will climb stems, Thorns will thrown leaves, acre over acre of elegy. Elsewhere, there is a fastening, a note pinned to your coat, another cyclone centering, suitable for wandering. Alter egret. Pay respects like a folded silhouette careens to salted dredge and eastern lee as the poppy weighted by its seed, rears to fledgling symmetry, anvil-eyed, starred feet. And that's it for the old stuff. Uh, most of my reading uh, are poems, uh, even shorter than those that I've uh, written very recently and never read aloud. Uh, a few years ago, I decided instead of giving up something for Lent, I would write a poem every day of it as a kind of prayer, but also as a, as a kind of, uh, I don't know, putting something into the world instead of taking something away. So I'll read some from this year's Lent poems. Breathing over and painting under my own cerulean ceiling, this time of many I should have fallen from, a makeshift ladder I wobbled on. Michelangelo, what did you know of scaffolding or sky? And who am I to ask? Still at the egg life, a shell chafed inside its critical ice. The glow, it grew and melted through a warmth that breaks apart, heavier radiance and the weight of the moon cracked the moon in two. Receipt. Jonah didn't know where he was going to pay by giving up his way. Transformation. Listen to the lilies along the road, sing over the thought to turn back home. Now, when we started Lent this year, we didn't know what it was gonna be like at the end of Lent. And in looking through these, I, I was interested to see how the consciousness of the severity of the pandemic sort of oozed into um, the language. Upside down, love of labor, snow days lose their flavor. Slowest night when fear ignites in those unused to losing, but me and mine, no darkness drops like sun on sand, no ocean stops. Stark, nothing hovers to block the moon, nor the wind and the rain it's rolling to. Outlaws, limbs and lechery where they shouldn't be, 
lamb too near the lion and smiling six feet apart or six feet under the times light years limit spring fever over pandemic. Processing the disorder. What am I facing when I'm facing you? Brick wall or mending view? Small normal. A simple repair. Some friends complain about their hair. Battle. The sun you see is on our side. These flags, our words, bleach in time. Vortex of the quotidian. Parallel father of the orderly world, were it not turned to sand, you'd rearrange the time of day. You'd move the hand with the hand. You give me an anchoring image that blossoms in a glass and stains the petaled clarity and drifts a world away to where you find eternity is neither sand nor hour, nor worlds undone what's labored on. And the end of the Lent poems, napalmed Sunday. All day long, a thought to burn, leaves I know will not return. So the next set of poems I'm, I'm going to read are uh, written um, as part of an exchange with a friend of, of mine and Cameron's too, uh, Linda Kinahan, who's a painter. And two years ago, I think uh, I proposed that in December and May, we would exchange a poem for a painting each day. And so uh, a lot of, of really interesting work has been generated from that uh, and a lot of interesting conversations between poetry and, and her paintings, which are wonderful. I definitely have the easier job. May poems from this year. Um, so just a few of those. Demitas, some marry for warmth, others repose, but most who know break a vow or two before a lifted cup, halfway filled or filling up. Veil of numbers. Keep the dust from playthings. Maturity is covering. Well past weeds and firsts, leverage or measurement. Upon the calendar's face, it's space we share to be replaced. This poem I wrote for a student who has been at the forefront of a movement to save our music and and theater programs, which our Board of Governors cut in May. Um, and this is, this is for Zach Fancher. Courage. Had I never shivered in the shade, I would not have stood the wilderness a burning sidewalk paved. Along its rooted undertow, we flinched to stop and flinched to go. So I'm gonna go back to the December poems. Uh, and I'm ending with uh, poems from our December 19 and 18 exchanges, because I think they're a little bit um, lighter maybe than some of the others, maybe not. Home Depot. Some keep the Sabbath loading lumber, white man, whiter teeth on the verge of explaining sexuality to the counter girl and me. When surplus interrupts our knowing sexton, nylon string needs his expertise gotten for a song. Here in almost heaven, I'm tolling all along. I thought that was funny. Acts of Colonial Defiance. Uh, this poem is in the new uh, issue of Phoebe, which I think is Jim's daughter's name. Um, they do a lovely job. Um, Acts of Colonial Defiance. This cold day, I bought a tree. The idea of it and soil spilled beyond gathering. Home we went, roots bared to wind, the way we made it then, arranged a room inside a room. I saw that I am too, but roots that reached a bucket's width, a shallow shape, 
around our thought than proof. Solstice, and we just had solstice yesterday, but this is the winter solstice poem. If tradition is the enemy of revolution, then maternity's a childhood invention and nation to nation thrown from wintered sleep melts in the rising sea. If faith is the only cure for doubt, don't count on light to make things right. Afterlife. We think existence might extend a longer conversation among friends and good for the collective good could grace us with a better neighborhood. Um, I'll end with uh, two poems uh, from the December 2018 exchange. Um, the first two are in the new uh, issue of Shenandoah. And I, I just wanted to say that Leslie Wheeler and Beth Staples are marvelous editors and really live their feminist practice of treating uh, contributors like more than just someone handing them something to print. Um, they, they respond to work rather than just publish it and, and have, have really uh, encouraged me to recommit myself to uh, an editorial practice that is humane. A threshold foyer door. Some stumble as they enter, others bolt before the bell. More summertime than wintertime, danger thrills the air. And Christmas shows the forests all the ax can still. Bright bulbs to bury, roots to trim, we bring the gardens in. Branches of arithmetic. Thinking, I forgot to talk and silence multiplied the rules. And for my finale, uh, a little conversation with Marian Moore that we were talking about earlier. Superior people rarely uncap, but some cannot withhold. Although restrained, they pop and bubble all honesty and offerings. Each writhes at insincerity, yet reliably, will knot your tie and lace your shoes, then stuff your mouth with solitude. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. That was uh, a great new poems. Thank you for sharing so many of them. So yeah, it's a treat, it's a real treat. Um, going forward, um, I am especially happy this afternoon to welcome Cameron Burnett to our round table. Uh, especially since I tried to welcome Cameron to Wheeling uh, in April and uh, the pandemic arrived. And uh, so we hope next April, Cameron, to, to have you here with us in Wheeling. Cameron is a Pittsburgh-based poet, blogger, and educator. He is the author of The Drowning Boy's Guide to Water from Autumn House Press. I, I came across this collection um, when I was reading the Hudson Review where Robert Archambault writes that it is a well-constructed cohesive collection in which form recedes into the background, refusing to draw attention to itself. Well, Cameron's poems are certainly that, but they're much, much more. It is simply as impressive a first book as I've read in a long time. Cameron holds an MFA from the University of Pittsburgh and teaches at the Falk Laboratory School there. Uh, kids, middle school kids, as I mentioned to him earlier, I admire that, having been that kind of teacher myself. I'm afraid I've not caught up to Cameron's blog, but his recent article in the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, Seven Tips for White Allies from a Black Pittsburgher, printed following the murder of George Floyd is I think, a must read for us all here in the wake of recent events. So it's my pleasure, Cameron, to welcome you to the round table this afternoon. And I look forward to hearing your poems. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me. I'm, I'm glad we could make this work and uh, definitely I'm looking forward to, to visiting in person, hopefully uh, yes. next April. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you to all the other readers as well, to Mary, to Elizabeth, your words are, are beautiful. I find, um, being in conversation and community with poetry to be really uh, important and special right now. Um, and also happy Father's Day out there to anyone watching uh, celebrating Father's Day. Uh, 
And Mark, you gave me a, a really beautiful introduction. I'm really grateful for that. Um, I'll just make my little speech about myself very quickly. If anyone's unfamiliar with my work, I write about race, romance, and relationships. I always say I do the three R's. Um, and, and I really try to explore uh, what it means to be black uh, in terms of breaking open the monolith of a particular race and how things can be viewed, excuse me, viewed um, as very sort of siloed. Uh, and so I'm always sort of searching and pushing in, in all the directions I can in my work. So I'm gonna read some poems from the Drowning Boy's Guide to Water that'll hopefully elucidate that for you. And I also have a few new poems that I'll, I'll try to get to as well. But I always like to start off uh, readings when I can with this poem, because uh, I think it gives a good first glimpse into my work. And so this is called To the Octopus. I got cold cocked in the mouth once by a kid blacker than me for talking white to him outside the cafeteria. Lost four teeth to the tiled hallway, painted a stripe of red down my shirt. I'd speak of the pain, but I'm telling you a story you already know. I have seen you cling to coral so tight, you become every color all at once. Camouflage is essential. We know this. But when I watch you, I realize how you can squeeze through most things if your mouth fits just right. I'm still learning. I held half my mouth in a sandwich bag when my father picked me up at school, couldn't tally each tooth in the blood smeared plastic, asked me, what did you do? I'm trying to be more like you now. The other day, I passed a brick wall, imagined my arms four, fourfold, pressed my palms to it until there was no air, but I didn't turn tan. Later, I stood on a packed bus, coiling my arms around the railing, still black. How do you shoot skin out of your body? I've seen you leave limbs behind, each a little brain distracting predators. You think of anything to stay alive. I have to mind my mouth and limbs in public. They don't grow back. My mother stayed in the operating room for hours. I was so sedated, she stayed by my side and never ate. I woke up to the dentist teasing her about the churn in her stomach. It was louder than my drill. Mothers will starve for us. They know this, hunger as second nature. Being eaten is what they call love, isn't it? My gums leaked well into the summer. I stopped brushing for weeks. Too many toothbrushes left and peppermint swirl, my mouth unchanged save for the cursing of that kid's name. Maybe if my blood were blue, I'd have three hearts like you. One for forgiving, one for forgetting, one for moving on. Watching you now, I know why you blacken the water and run. This is also a favorite poem of mine, I can find the page, right? Um, that I, I like to read. Um, my poetic obsessions are anything from seasons to months having specific um, meanings in my head when I write about them to constellations and anything to do with stars and space. I've always been a space nerd. Um, and so this poem sort of takes up those interests and, and put them into some of my poetic focuses. Uh, it's called Supernova. The little boy I babysit loves Hot Wheels and Zoids, keeps a dusty Nerf gun under his bed. He prefers connects to Legos, has knobby knees and gap teeth, red brown skin like me. In his room, there's a telescope by the window where his brother's bed used to be. At night we sit there, next bent, eyes to the glass. He just started fifth grade. So there's a star in the galaxy for every question he asks me. Was the Big Bang real? Are aliens real? When they die, do they go to heaven too? I want to tell him about the other side of the universe where bombs go off that we never know about for millennia. I've learned to boil answers down to one word. Yes, maybe, hopefully. I've learned one word is all it takes to break a kid. Only 10, but he leaves rooms when he hears black boys' names on the news. <clears throat> He gets quiet when guns go off in movies, so I turn the TV off at night. We don't say his brother's name. On the couch, he finds more questions. How do stars stay in the sky? I say, gravity. Want to say, I don't know how to explain, say, but you can recognize it by how the planets fall toward them, say, everything out there is always falling. He falls asleep with his feet against my thigh, 
kicks them when he's dreaming, and I want to kiss his forehead, want to calm him. He reminds me how close we are to explosion, that things always break apart from the center. He's lived it, a kid who loves space. He teaches me things too. In 50,000 years, the Little Dipper will shift, will resemble more of a bent, crushed Coke can, the hind leg of Ursa Minor collapsing into its gut. I'm afraid he will become like the stars of Draco, serpentine curve twisted into shipwreck. He deserves more than this, a solar system spinning around him, every scrap of gravity left over from the Big Bang. I want to take the boiling stone from his core, name it dignity, mold it while hot, christen it with a kiss and cool it into something the world will recognize, but I don't want to betray him. How many stars named after black kids or light years until the next supernova? I want him to know what room America has left for black love, black boys, black families, maybe, hopefully. One night I dreamt Emmett Till visited Ferguson, Missouri. Nobody recognized him. Not until he laid down next to Michael Brown's body. Not until he kissed him. I think I'll read the title poem from the book and then move on to some new, newer work um, from a uh, hopefully soon to be manuscript that I'd like to put some real work into this summer now that most things are shut down and <laughs> there's no way to escape writing poetry. Um, so this poem is sort of, uh, it's the title poem that anchors the whole collection together uh, in a sense. So this is called The Drowning Boy's Guide to Water. Remember the strength of chlorine, the indoor pool, swim class clinging to the kickboard, then jumping from the ledge into the arms of the smiling white lady, only mostly sure she would catch you. Mom calling Cameron, Cameron, to get you to look, then said kick kick. Remember, there's nothing a mother won't do for one still shot of your head above the water. It's important to always practice good form. Kick your legs. Remember Tortola, the sea like melted marbles and the sun at the equator, your brown skin browning. With a stretch of snorkel between your teeth, you jumped in and chased a sea turtle for the length of the tiny island's beach. The pressure in your ears right when you thought you could catch it, mom and dad sighing when you came back to the surface. Remember your worst fear is not being able to breathe. Most people who drown are brown and 80% of people who drown are male. Don't forget to kick your legs. Don't forget middle school musicals, all the costumes and makeup, the white boys making jokes about blackface, the laughter gurgling in their necks, no one else like you to back you up. Sometimes you will swallow water. Remember, a throat is the size of a skittle or a hole in a hoodie and Trayvon's legs kicked hard against the night. Drowning isn't loud or splashy, it's silent, autonomic, neck tilt and terror. When you are drowning, feet become rocks, hands push down water in vain and the thump of blood is the only thing that can be heard. It is all supposedly painless. Always remember that. Always remember your first girlfriend's grandmother sneering at the sight of her white arms wrapped up in your hoodie, how you pretended it was painless, but you couldn't help but kick your legs, or how nobody will save you anymore when you yell, I can't breathe, so just kick your legs, or every sidewalk where a white girl sees you, pulls her phone up to her face and crosses the street like she's guarding something secret. Kick your legs. Remember that you have been a white girl's secret before. Kick your legs when you are drowning. Don't forget to practice good form. Float on the surface, part the water with your lips, only swallow as much as you can hold. All right, so the new work is on the computer. Let me pull it up here. Um, and I'm gonna read a few poems here and uh, bear with me if some of the, the imagery and metaphor clings a little bit or, or overlaps because I'm really, I'm still, trying to pull apart these ideas in these new poems, um, but I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with some new things now, in particular stuff about the heart, um, trying to make the heart interesting and not as cliche as it sometimes might otherwise be. Um, so this first poem is called Murmur. This became my first ghost, the cold cup of a stethoscope to my infant chest, 
an echo deep in a doctor's ear. The sound she heard, named it murmur, a swoosh in the space between the beatings of my youngest heart. When I'd run around as a toddler, my mother always anticipated me falling down and not getting back up. Later, my father's stethoscope told us there was nothing there. This became my second ghost. I played every sport I could growing up. I ran until no kid in my class could outpace me. I beat my heart up and down playgrounds and courts through grass stains and bloody knees. I wanted to learn how to make my heart sing and I wanted to silence it too, but always my mother's gaze was heavy on me. Be careful, she would say, and be careful, dad would say. I ignored them. When I did karate as a high schooler, running up against men twice my size, my mother said, be careful. And my father said, be careful. And because I didn't care for my heart then, I was careless. Heartbreak came when I fell in love for the first time. And my mother said nothing. And my father said nothing. And years passed with no echo to interrupt the ending as they held me. And we all listened to my third ghost singing in the space between the beatings. And now I run miles a day for my health. And now I am a haunted house of scars. And now I always fear like too many men in my family that I will die because of my heart. I always fear like too many black men that a heart is not enough to keep me alive. We are all ghost stories, silent chests, a heavy wager of collapse. And isn't this what all our mothers fear? The fourth ghost? Every echo of love misplaced somewhere deep in our hearts, reconvening over us in our stillness, murmuring, be careful. So this is probably, this next one, my newest poem. Um, and actually, I think this will be my last poem too. Um, yeah, I wanna end on this one. Um, as the pandemic was um, beginning to unfold in America, I was uh, on spring break traveling with my partner for research on this future manuscript in South Carolina where I have some ancestral roots. So um, this is sort of a collection of the things that I was learning and taking in while I was there. So it's called South Carolina. From here, perhaps I come. The counties as crinkled as the creeks, but the ground runs low slow scraped into the horizon where the highway slips beneath the dark edges of the day, like the long pole of a comforter up past the eyes. I'm too fast for this place, but my blood has borne that out already. Everything, as they say, slower here. The land is an open mouth full of water. Even the rain has nowhere to go. It sits and seeps by the road on the way to the plantation I visit one night. <clears throat> Under a Chinese light show, I hold my love's white hand while we pass LED frogs and dragons. I'm not looking at the lights. I regard the live oaks and what they might know. What weight has sunk their roots and gnarled their limbs? Perhaps we recognize each other. I didn't know how wooded this land was. I don't know everything that these woods know, but I know the dark edges of the plantation hold back everything I love. The pulse in my neck is a whisper of wings through the branches. In the air, a barracoon tune hangs like Spanish moss. In this, my making. In this, my heart. There is no joggling board flexible enough to bring together my tears and the turf. From here, perhaps, I come through a line of blacksmiths, the census labeled illiterate. And from illiteracy, they come with the name Fogey hammered into their blood, and from some other blood we know they were purchased. I regard South Carolina as I do Ireland, two islands in a sea of my making. Sometimes I wonder what else the land has lied to me about. I wonder what the history books would say if they knew how blood could echo. I wonder today, as the news plays, what they expect me to think of social distancing as if I'm not always six feet away from really knowing who I am. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. That was marvelous. Thanks so much. It's good to hear you read. Good to have you with us. Jim Harms. Jim is a truly remarkable poet 
admired by his colleagues who number many of the finest poets writing in America today. His eight books of poetry include his most recent volume, Rowing with Wings from Carnegie Mellon University Press. I cannot name all the accolades his work has received, but he is the winner of the prestigious NEA Fellowship in Poetry, winner of three Pushcart Prizes, has received the Penn Revson Foundation Fellowship, the John Charty Fellowship for the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and honored with residencies at both Yaddo and McDowell. Campbell McGrath has said this about Jim's work. At the noisy fiesta of contemporary American poetry, James Harms refuses to speak in tongues, wear a goofy hat, or drink upside down tequila shots. His coolly meditative poems offer up smart and lyrical commentaries upon contemporary social scenes and manage to make large points without ever raising their voices. It's true. And more. Here's a poet who can provide close details wedded to human tenderness in a way that's simply heartbreaking and wondrous. Jim, thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you, Mark. Jim Harms needs a haircut, but we're going to continue anyway. So it's great to be here. It's been wonderful to hear these other fantastic poets read, and I'm honored to be able to Zoom with all of you. Um, I'm going to start with a, a poem about my daughter, Phoebe, and Elizabeth mentioned her, which I thought was a nice symmetry. Um, it's, it's a poem about her when she was eight years old. She's 21 now, so this gives you a sense of how long it takes poems to happen and get into books, since this is also in the newest book. The poem mentions a song called I Thank You, which was performed by Sam and Dave. You would recognize it if you heard it, but it's, it's pretty old. Phoebe at eight. You fell asleep by the river. I walked back carrying you, your sandals hooked in my fingers. The glow of stardust on leaves lingered in between the black of sky and the black of earth. I drove while you slept, wondering if with you I'd ever run out of chances. At the corner of Texaco near home, you danced around the car, washing windows to the wandering baseline of I thank you. I filled the tank and tried to remember the words, the song nailed in place to 1968, the wrong year as it turned out to think about thanks. You were unimagined, unknowable then. I was exactly your age, as free as I've ever been. We've had a rough year, but I'm still not convinced We've made it to the level of awfulness of 1968, but we're working on it. Um, unfortunately, we're working too hard on it. So when the lockdown started, I had a friend smart enough and nice enough to initiate a project with 80 some odd poets. And I was included in which she would send out a poem or a prompt every day. And we were all required to write a poem every day. So when Elizabeth was talking about her Lent poems, I, I felt somewhat in a league since I was I managed to do 40 poems in 40 days and then I just dissolved into dust um, but now back I'm going to read a couple of these poems just because they're new and that seems to be a good idea right now <clears throat> so this was the last poem I wrote May 15th 2020 um, for this particular project and then my son and I had to start moving from one place to another so I had to stop I think they made it to 60 prompts, but I don't think anybody wrote quite that many poems. 40 poems is, is enough. And this one's called Tuna Sandwich. My brother picks at his tuna sandwich, slowly, precisely. He's opened up the sandwich so he can better see the bits of celery and relish the stuff he hates, though he never says it. Our stepmother is handed around the paper plates at lunch and now stands in the doorway between kitchen and dining nook, arms crossed, watching. My brother asked 
the first day we visited this new home, a condominium in Montebello, what's a nook? And now, like always, he is picking out the celery, the relish, placing each bit on the paper plate beside the sandwich. When he's done, he replaces the bread, lifts the sandwich, takes a bite. He lowers the sandwich and pushes away from the table. Done, he says. Our stepmother begins to cry. My sister looks at her, her own sandwich in hand. She is chewing deliberately, studying our stepmother. Why do you keep putting that stuff in his sandwich, she says. I have no idea where our father is or why he is living in Montebello with his new wife or why we must visit him once a month. But I love my brother more in that moment than I ever have before, though I have never before thought about how much I love my brother. He is standing now beside the dining table in the nook. Can I go outside, he says. My stepmother screams, a short burst of sound like a cat's yowl in the middle of the night. My sister and I flinch. Where is my other sister? She is oldest and never there. My brother just stands by the table until my stepmother covers her mouth with her hand and runs down the dark hallway to the bedroom she shares with our father, which we've never seen. It was not a part of the tour, like the kitchen, the nook, the fold-out sofa my brother and I sleep on. My brother is 10 years old. He winks at me, then heads out the front door into Montebello, which is not at all like Altadena, where our mother, for all we know, is eating a tuna sandwich properly made. I am two years older than my brother. I practice that wink, his wink, for the rest of my life. So I don't remember any of these prompts, which was really reckless of me not to write down the prompts, but these are the poems. This one's called Figured You Out. It didn't take long, just a few years, at the end of a normal life, hers and yours, I never said. I never used to say, it's just money. Everyone signs their name aspirationally, as if became instead, almost. The lazy way out, he died mid-dream. There was a smear on the wall, it's how you could tell. Count back until you're rich. She rated red, green, yellow, red. She waited until we all agreed. Jack in the box or McDonald's? Go, we said, just go. The lazy dream between, he held the phone to her ear. I said, almost, I'm sure, in June. A catch sailed off the edge of June. They're buttercups, she said silently. He picked the fruit a year too early. Can you hear me? I never said. A few minutes late, a whistle wrapped in plastic. Her hand cold and soft like wet paper dried. Not a whisper, just breath against glass. Or a smudge of ashes in the sink. A dollar sign at the end of his signature. A dollar sign tattooed beneath her collarbone. A sip of water, like a bird at the edge of a puddle a change, a candle, a bracelet in the dirt. Okay, so this poem is too long to read, so I will begin immediately. Um, the thing you need to know is that it's primarily organized around sound, and it's playing a lot with the name Guy, G-U-Y, which is Guy in French and other languages. It sounds differently, but it's set in Los Angeles when I was in high school in Pasadena and uh, features prominently the um, sitcom Hogan's Heroes, which ran in the late 60s, which was set at a POW camp during World War II and was very funny. And the only other thing you need to know, and I hate doing this to explain so many things, but just in case you don't know, Manzanar was a relocation camp, an internment camp um, where Japanese Americans were imprisoned during World War II, so was um, Tule Lake, which was another internment camp, and they're both in California. <clears throat> I think that's all you need to know. 
And the title's important. It's called Guy Slaps Me for Laughing in His Kitchen. Guy was pronounced Guy with a hard G. Guy was the way he said it. He wrote his name, G-U-Y, in the Daily Special on a chalkboard by the kitchen door. Not for the guests, he said. Diners was what we called them at my last job at Denny's. But for all us busboys and waitstaff so that we might know his nightly brilliance. He drew a flowered and colored chalk next to his name. Names. What was her name? The older waitress who teased me as I cleared her tables and tipped out one night with a joint she offered to share in the parking lot behind the pro shop. The restaurant overlooked the country club's 10th hole, just a dog leg and a fairway from the 12th, where my friends and I would haul ice blocks up the hillside bordering the green and slide down half drunk and all stupid, laughing like busboys in a kitchen who think the chef sounds like Louis LeBeau from Hogan's Heroes. And so, he slapped me. Ivan Dixon. He acted on Hogan's Heroes, and for years I'd see his name in the credits of TV shows, always as a director, as if he'd flipped a switch, tired of trying to be the one black face in a series of bad series, his face now small and vague at the other end of the camera lens. His son, Guy, went to high school with me, the name strange to look at on a sheet of paper, N-G-A-I, though I think we called him Guy, as in Guy. I heard he died before his dad died, died young, like a lot of guys from my high school. She had a slow sexiness I didn't understand, the waitress, and was probably in college somewhere. I'm sure she thought it weird that I shrugged and smiled and drove away from her offers, off to be with my girlfriend, to sneak into her window late at night after the dinner shift and back out again before her father went for his morning walk when he might notice my car at the end of the block. Her father. He'd been in Manzanar or maybe the Thule Lake camp or out in Arizona. He didn't talk about it. He didn't talk as far as I could tell at all. And he probably hated me for good reason. Sneaking in and out of his daughter's window Sorry for the sins of my tribe and the way that teenagers are sorry for anything, not much. But I was true to his daughter who invited me to her wedding. She married a guy as white as I am, though I'm sure he was smarter about talking to the father of three beautiful sensei daughters, a father like any, except maybe for the years in Manzanar. I don't remember him at the reception, which was at the country club's fancy French restaurant though it wasn't French anymore and no Guy anywhere. In fact, no longer fancy in the slightest, more a shiny breakfast place than a bistro, a Denny's wearing pearls and polo. When Guy slapped me, I took a step back, cocked my fist and froze as if punching a haughty Frenchman might be a lot like riding an ice block at night down a manicured hall of, hill of grass, spinning and laughing across the fairway as the black me block melted through my pants and slowed to a stop near the green. Foolish. I wish I'd kissed her, the waitress, whose name I can't remember, <clears throat> who touched my forearm softly whenever she talked to me, who smiled through smoke on her cigarette breaks and told me stories about some town in Colorado she used to live in. When I came in to get my last check, she was there folding napkins and prepping the dinner shift. She waved me out onto the deck to have a camel light and tell me what had happened after I tore off my apron and threw it at Louis Lebeau's feet instead of hitting him. How the restaurant manager heard what he'd done and called out Guy in front of everyone, cooks, waitresses, busboys. She said he ripped them a new one and she smiled when she said it and cocked her chin a little. So I knew she was right there in the middle of the memory. <clears throat> but then she shook her head and dropped the cigarette, smashed it with her toe and said, it, said the rest. The manager was fired the next day, since a French chef is harder to find than a guy from Glendale in charge of staff schedules and greeting the rich as they arrived to partake in La Cuisine des Guy. What was his name, the manager? <clears throat> and hers, the waitress. Why do I only remember geese? 
which didn't even run rhyme with guys, whose older brother Ivan also died young. Their dad played Staff Sergeant James Kinch Kinchlow on Hogan's Heroes and left the show before the final season. I remember that he wasn't even written out of the story. It was like they just forgot all about him. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to do this. Thank you, Jim. Marvelous. Uh, that's my word this afternoon, I guess, but uh, they were great poems. Thank you for sharing them with us. Thank you to all of you. That <laughs> What an amazing crew you are. Um, I can't imagine four finer poets gathered together than we have here this afternoon. Um, it's at this point uh, that I'm going to uh, float some questions uh, by all of you and feel free to respond as, as you wish. Um, an impossible sort of question, um, so I'll leave it open-ended so you can do with it what you wish, uh, but what do you think makes for a good poem or if in any way different than that, what makes for a publishable poem? Um, or on a related note, I know a couple of you've mentioned that you're working on manuscripts. When do you know that a manuscript is done, is, is ready to send out? And, and, but be that a, a full length collection, a chat book, or even just when do you know that you've got two or three poems that might be worthy of publication in a magazine or journal somewhere. So, and Maria can help, uh, help out too if we need. Anyone wanna go first? I can say that I no longer know <laughs> the, the answer to any of those questions. I feel like, yeah, it's really important to stay stupid a little bit when it comes to what a poem can be. Um, it's a very uh, it's an endlessly flexible genre as the poems we heard today reflect. And as for when a book's done, it's like when the, book, when the poems you're writing stop fitting with the ones that you've already written, seems like a good indication that the book's done. <laughs> Good. Well, I, don't know I, I can say, which I started to before, but I was muted, that um, <clears throat> I had no idea. <laughs> I need other people to help me with book manuscripts. I can put them together, but apparently not that well on my own. So I rely on other people to help me with that. Um, I want to put them together by associating images rather than topics, um, like a key image from a poem or the image at the end of a poem, moving into next poem. But um, so I'll just say I tried, but I don't think I know how. <laughs> Fair enough. I think for me, it's, um... I always talk about story um, because before I started writing poetry in earnest, I um, was working on a really long quasi memoir fiction thing in high school, <laughs> basically a journal with a story on top of it. Um, and so I always say that I have fiction roots and uh, I, I think that's true in, in a lot of the poems that I tend to write, they are uh, much more narrative than lyric, um, though they have their moments of both. Um, and so for me, whatever the story, uh, which might be, you know, another word for that, whatever the essence of it is that you are trying to express feels complete. Or if I'm looking at a collection uh, of whatever length, um, if the arc feels like it's, it's really, I don't know, crested, um, that's when I tend to know. Um, and, and just like Mary also, I, I rely heavily on my uh, network of fellow writers to kind of say, this batch, yes. This batch, another yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Back to the idea of a poem. I think I look for sound and image in a poem. And for me personally, as the writer, I, I get bored. I'm old and I've read a lot. And I'm bored by my poem. You know, it's not going to fly. So I look for a surprise and discovery. Elizabeth, is there anything you want to add here? Well, I just, that's such a terrible question, Mark, and you're such a <laughs> nice person. Um, I think is, especially as an editor, and I think all of us as poets too know that a lot of it is, there's not some transcendent good 
there's a lot of really good poems that I just don't like, and I don't take them for, for Kestrel. Um, and, and I tried to, to let writers know that I've read their work and what I saw in it that was interesting or strong. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, Don, Donna Long is the, is the general editor of Kestrel and she, she is a, a very different kind of poet uh, from the kind of poet that I, that I tend to be. But we, I think I can think of maybe three times in the 12 years we've been editing that we disagreed about what a good poem was. Hmm. So I, th there must be something there, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I also, you know, I'm really, I know it's about, you know, the subjective um, and there's lots of, there's lots of ways to write a good poem, just like there's lots of ways to write a bad poem, I guess. But uh, what yeah. I think is good may not be what you think is good. And, um, but I, I, I like poems that are, that are, that I, you know, that are interesting, that I'm thinking about beyond, and that doesn't mean that they're complicated or obscure or anything, but that have me thinking about them in a way that a song will run through your head. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Some okay. certain, okay. certain poems, certain lines will, will haunt me sometimes. I, I'm not even perhaps aware of it when I first read the poem, but on reflection, I realize, oh yeah, that had, whatever that thing is, it had it and it's uh, going to stick around with me. Uh, if I go on, let me ask a quick question to Maria, at least on my screen, I still only have Jim full screen. So I don't know if that's true for everybody or. Yeah, that's true for me. Yeah, me too. We're on gallery view. <laughs> so, um, I think in the past when we've done this live that I found audiences do love to have a glimpse into our personal lives as authors, especially your, your daily work habits. Now I realize this, um, that may have changed in the last few months what that dailiness looks like, but uh, if such a thing is possible, can you each describe something of what your typical work practice is, let's put it that way, you know, uh, a time, a place, the tools you have at hand. I know I have, you know, at least one colleague that, you know, particular pencils and pens are actually really uh, important to them. I know other friends who, you know, have to have a particular kind of cocktail or martini before they can set to the real work. So um, anyone want to have a go at that? I tend to um, do the same process, uh, although I've tried to branch out a little bit more and, and see what doing a different approach would, would do to my work. But I, I keep a long running list of ideas and phrases and borrowings and, and all sorts of things. And then much like a painter might, although I don't know, maybe we should ask Linda Kinahan what she thinks. <laughs> I, I tend to take a little dab and put it on my palette um, and throw a bunch of words, a bunch of phrases onto a document and then twist them around, rearrange them, connect them, put lines between them and just see what kind of Frankenstein thing I can throw together. Um, that's always been my default way of doing it. Um, and I can do that in any room. I can do that in any setting. I, you know, I, I don't know. That's just how I do it. Interesting, Cameron. Really interesting kind of like brainstorming in a way. Yeah, a lot like that. Collecting stuff. I tend to uh, have a cup of coffee and set down to writing after breakfast every morning. I love it. <laughs> I love my study and I love my coffee. I have uh, certain notebooks that I start new poems in. This is my current one. I like those decomp notebooks decomposition they had great covers um <clears throat> and i also collect things like cameron does i collect places sometimes i just look out my window and write what i see out my window and it might lead me somewhere and it might not or i go to the park and do the same thing or i sit on my porch uh, so there's a combination of ways to start. And sometimes I also pick up somebody else's book and just read a poem for the energy of the poem. 
and uh, set it aside and look at my list and then go outside or, or whatever. So it's a combination of, of stuff. Oh, that's, I, I, I felt that I was addicted to the, the series for a while. My, my yeah. book and my chat book too were, you know, one file that I worked through until I had enough poems to make the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I got worried that I had to have some, I don't know, but like the, my chat book, A uh, Woman Looking at a Vase of Flowers, that's a, a reading almost line by line really of, of Stevens's um, poem, the same name. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, 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 I think these dailies probably came up in fear that I had to have some unifying idea um, and I was worried that would become gimmicky really quickly. Mm -hmm. So, so the, uh, the, the discrete poems that I've been writing, even though they're daily, they rarely, even though there'll be patterns and, and, and you know, themes that kind of show up, um, yeah. that they're, they're not, um, you know, they're not tied to one another in that way. Uh, it's obvious that a big part of my process is reading other poets. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really walk that line between plagiarism and conversation uh, with uh, Niedeker and, and uh, Dickinson and uh, Stevens. Um, Elizabeth Willis's work is really important to me too. I also, I love to read scholarship. You know, I love to read uh, criticism on poetry and literature. Um, and, and often I will find the best <laughs> awakenings just in combinations of words or, or readings of poems that I might not even have ever read. So yeah, yeah. Jim? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think because I have three kids age 11 to 25. So it's, to me, it's been really important never to have a process. Um, <laughs> because I'm just not going to get to repeat it every day. And I don't, so I try never to have to write any one place or use any particular kind of pen or pencil or on the computer or not on the computer or, you know, whatever, anything at all is fine with me. And I'll write about anything knowing that eventually it's going to get where it wants to go. So I don't like writing at night. That's about the only thing I write better in the morning. Yeah, me too. We'll move ahead. Um, I'm so tempted to talk about my own process, but uh, it's a little bit of everybody's here. <laughs> I'll say one thing. I, I, I'm fond of saying this lately, and, uh, but uh, I often in recent years find that there's certain poets that are so completely different than myself. And sometimes they're even poets I don't particularly like, but there's something in their work that gets inside me and just drives me to my pen or pencil. And I just realized, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, there's, there was a time in the past when I would pick up John Ashbery of all people. And, uh, <laughs> but before I knew it, I was just scribbling like mad. And the, the poems I was writing looked nothing like Ashbery whatsoever, but uh, he somehow hit that, that mad rush of words got inside me. And, uh, and, and for which I was grateful. I was very grateful that, you know, that there was a, uh, a kind of a dependable source of, I almost hate to use the word inspiration, but I don't know what else to call it that would uh, work on me at times. And I guess I'm circling around to simply saying, and, and, and I hope there are people listening and watching today who feel like they're maybe beginners or something. And I, I want you to know that the reading of anything can be really, really important and not to, to over worry while well, my reading the best poet writing in America today or the best poet that once wrote once upon a time, you know, just for, you know, forget all that, enjoy yourself and just let the poems come. Um, on a more serious uh, topic, I, and I wrote down this question, not only are we meeting here today virtually, reminding us of the pandemic, um, whose shadow still surrounds us, that's the virtual. But we have been, I hope, urgently reminded in the past few weeks of the profound injustice still dogging America's dream. So that said, have either of those um, come into your work? And if so, in what way? Um, 
So I think that's enough if someone can can uh, speak to that. Oh, and I and you already have. I've seen that in in some of the work already read this afternoon. I was going to say my practice of writing what I see, then I also what's happening in the world comes in to what I write. And so there's a, a sense that I can, I can no longer shut out, if I ever could, what is going on around me. And uh, I do try to uh, only write from my own point of view as much I mean, I can't uh, try to be anything other than what I am and write from the position that I occupy. But I hope that in doing that, I engage something of what's going on. Yeah, with, with the daily practice, I, I've noticed I, I think that the process itself really invites a uh, his, historical saturation and it comes in in the language, even if I'm not deliberately writing about yeah. something, mm -hmm. uh, but it will often sort of expose something that is all around. And I, I definitely think I, I, I've, I've, I've been a pretty ferociously optimistic person for most of my life and I don't think I am anymore. And I'm, I'm at least not right now. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my faith in causality went out the window somewhere around November 16 and um, hasn't, hasn't really been back. Could I ask, I, I think my internet cut out for, for a moment and I missed the end of the question. Um, would, would you mind restating it, Mark? Sure, not at all. I just, um, in, if I find it, in, in what ways do we find either the pandemic um, or the multiple instances of racial injustice in America uh, coming in and informing our work? Uh, in fact, let me just go ahead, Cameron, if you don't mind. Um, do you want to say anything about the article you wrote for the Tribune Review? Um, I was, and if, and if it helps, I could point, I know one of the things you had mentioned there is that um, I thought it was very interesting what you had to say about social media uh, in the article. You say, remember all the little black boxes in your timeline from last week and how, and how there's a, a kind of risk there, uh, I think, or a liability to that good intention. But yeah, I'll, I'll shut up. Can you? Yeah, no, I, I wrote the article because I often find myself um, as a black man, but primarily walking in white circles and white worlds or white predominated circles and spaces. Um, sort of in a place of like, right between like large racial issues um, and, and how to understand them. Um, and also leaning on the fact that I am an educator, sort of just having that, that switch inside of me. And so um, I, I wanted to write about like, well, let's assume somebody has all the right intentions. They, they're moved by what's going on. They're disgusted, they're outraged as we all should be, um, but they don't know where to begin. And it can be really paralyzing to, to want to do the right thing and not know because it is such a, a heated and charged space and, and thing. And so I was like, well, if you are you know, a white ally or if you're seeking to become one, if you're just starting out, what should you know? And so, uh, you know, it's not comprehensive. Um, and in my own personal social media, when I posted it, um, I also said, you know, I'm just one black voice and, and don't take what I'm saying as representative for how every person you might encounter or engage will feel or experience to understand things. But I, as in my, my poetry and in my larger life and social justice um, sort of thinking, I'm always seeking to establish relationships and I'm always seeking to sort of like create connections. Um, and, and so that's where the article comes from. And that's where a lot of my work honestly comes from trying to understand uh, exactly how to piece myself together, like I said, sort of in between uh, many other rather distinct siloed worlds um, 
and realizing that I'm, I have a foot in every one of those spaces, but I am one person. So um, I think I stumbled my way through that response, but that's, that's how I, I write. I, I think that's what was so good about your article. And I think what I'm, I'm presuming all of us, the, the five of us, six of us here this afternoon, that you were looking at the multiple ways in which we can make connections, can indeed be true allies for each other in, in times of um, times like these. So, Jim, did you want to say anything here? Um, yeah, I mean, I wrote the Ivan Dixon poem about uh, <clears throat> three weeks before, you know, the murder of George Floyd. I think, I, you know, I grew up in, in the Pasadena School District, which um, was the second school district in the country to um, integrate via forced busing. So it was a it was a pretty tumultuous time, but it was a really, really an amazing time. So I came, grew up in Los Angeles between the Watts riots and Rodney King's beating, which was a period of time where things were actually seemingly, at least where I lived, which now seems like a bubble, um, very hopeful. So after Floyd's murder, it, it was, uh, it was really painful to be spending a lot. Well, we spent a lot of time together, 12 or 13 of us just texting all from that same neighborhood, um, talking about the difference between our lives going forward from those times together. Um, and, you know, it was like, in some ways it was very similar to thinking about the virus. It was as if we thought we had been inoculated from, you know, from racism as, a ch as children because of the fortunate circumstances of of integration and, and the priorities of our parents, which were very much about um, schools being a place where we could learn to, to not just be friends, but to understand that as a fact of, of our existence. But then, you know, you realize that there is no inoculation for that, that it's something that we have to work on every step of the way. So that was, it was a really a interesting time. I mean, the only thing I wrote was, was a kind of an op-ed piece, but I only ended up sharing it with with that group of friends. But again, it was a really helpful experience. And unless I'm really mistaken, Cameron, as I read over your article, one of the points you really made was that it's important for white people to be talking with each other, which you know, uh, Jim's sort of given a testimony of that just now with his old friends and, and they're recalling their history back. At, uh, oh, this, and most of these, at least half of these folks were people of color. So we were able to really compare our yeah. lives. Even though we thought we understood each other's lives, we realized we didn't. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important as I even look in my own friend circle of, um, you know, young people who in I think the general consciousness are assumed to be more progressive. Um, sometimes these conversations aren't happening. Uh, outwardly, people are saying, yeah, things are bad. Um, but it's it's different when you realize that the work that goes on under the hood, so to speak, um, isn't always running the same way in every person. Um, and so that's why that that part of my article is there to say, like, it's not only OK, it's absolutely vital that we be having conversations in our private spheres. You know, bring that into a place where everything matters um, vitally to you and have that conversation there. And I think that's when we can begin to to see some change, hopefully. Yes. We'll, we'll build Elizabeth's optimism back up. <laughs> I'm still hopeful. Um, I'm a prisoner of hope, but I, <laughs> I'm not so much optimistic. Well, thank you of that, maybe an, this might be an appropriate uh, question here. I can see um, how it might be, and that is, are there particular authors um, you see as having an influence on your work, uh, either past or present, um, an author that you read that has you reaching for your, your pen uh, that you would uh, point to as an influence in your, in your work, either again, in the past or right this very moment. Well, you said, you said Ashbury, which, and you sort of said him dismissively. I think I think of him as the most important poet of the late 20th century. So, I mean, I've, I've got an entire, you know, 10 feet of bookshelf devoted to John Ashbery, who's been endlessly influential. But most of the writers that are important to me, I don't write anything like. And I'm, that makes me, in some ways, really, really happy. Um, 
just that, you know, I'm always, I want to reach for things I can't do. And that doesn't mean I'm going to ultimately end up doing them. But writers like Ashbery and the whole New York bunch were great. Um, <clears throat> fond of a poet who doesn't get enough attention, attention. And she died a few years ago, um, mostly because her husband eclipsed her career, unfortunately. Her name was Eleanor Ross Taylor. And she's just a, was a remarkable poet and very quietly wrote just a, a stunning, stunning body of work that's really been important to me over the years. And I don't think she gets read enough. So I would encourage people to look at her work. Thank you. I, I've been reading Mona Van Dyne, another uh, really wonderful poet who has fallen out of style and Madeline Dupree, similarly a uh, poet pretty well known in the 60s and 70s, would you say, Jim? And yeah. They were both writing well after that, but they were kind of more of a thing. Right, um, right. And, and now they've fallen out of, uh, out of consideration. I also read uh, and really enjoy Rebecca Gale Howell. Oh my gosh. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, Contemporary Appalachian poet, um, apocalyptic vision, um, and just wonderful, um, sh often short poems uh, and series. Elizabeth, uh, I love writing in series too, so I know what you mean about that. Um, who else? Um, Totally different, uh, Kathleen Pierce, who I never hear much about either, who's a somewhat spiritual poet. Um, and I think it's strongly influenced by philosophy in a way, but it doesn't pop out of her, of her work. But she's been reading people like Gaston Bachelard and uh, in particular, uh, and so there's a, a kind of um, slowness and grace in her. She's very meditative, and I like that. It's not, it's a, it's like a part of me. It helps me access that part of me that's like that. Whereas the part of me that wrote the Amanda poems is kind of seedy and, and, and even a little bit glib. So I guess I like that counterbalance. Thank you. Cameron? I I would say, um, yeah, I think Elizabeth mentioned earlier, um, like reading criticisms and such. I, um, in a great departure from my earlier life, have really fallen into reading almost exclusively nonfiction if I'm not reading poetry. Um, and lately I've been reading uh, Ibram X. Kendi's uh, Stamp from the Beginning, um, which is so far really great. I'm only maybe a hundred pages in and even things like that, just like the history of, uh, of the world of society of race, um, learning little things like how, um, maybe it's Newton or, or I forget who, which whatever famous scientist, um, as he was discovering and like naming how we think of light, uh, he named like regular light white light based off of um, other racial theories going on in the world at the time. And, and the idea of whiteness is like purity or standardness. Um, and, and now we all just say white light <laughs> and not really aware of that history. And I'm like, that's fascinating. Like I want to play with that. Um, so there's that uh, in the poetry world. Uh, I'm honestly reading a lot of my friends right now. Um, so I'll shout out uh, a book called Hot With The Bad Things by Lucia Lotempio. Um, my Heart But Not by My Heart by Stephanie Colley are, are two uh, pit MFAs of mine who just put out um, first books and, and they're terrific. But I would also say I go back to my mentor, Terrence Hayes, um, oh. a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was very fortunate to get to work with him at Pitt um, and any success I've had, I think is, is very much credited. Yep. Yeah. Right yeah. on my desk. That's, that's <laughs> terrific. Um, and, and the thing I like about Terrence, I feel like he's, he's pretty well known in this region. Um, and so I'm not bringing him up simply as like a pass, but because he once said, either in a class I had or some setting, I heard him say that a poem should be about as many things 
as possible at once. I'm paraphrasing. And I remember hearing that and taking that as like overwhelming, but an amazing challenge. Um, and I think when you read his work, you realize he's, he's, he's going there. Um, he's often hitting that mark. Um, and so I, I like to think of, uh, you know, remember him and think of that idea that whatever poem I'm trying to do, or even a collection, like I wanted to have the potential to be about as many things as possible at once. I wonder if that's not one of those things that sometimes, as I said earlier, haunts me when I've read a really good poem. I don't know, I don't know what that is, but there's just that it's overwhelmed me. And I wonder if that doesn't have that going on for it sometimes. Elizabeth? Well, um, I'm, I'm currently reading the summer beach classic, uh, Queering the Color Line by Cervant Somerville. Uh, I'm also uh, reading, um, reading for this uh, long project I've been working on. It seems like forever because I've been thinking about it forever, but it's about uh, gun tropes and contemporary poetics. So, wow. so I've read um, a lot. There's not enough about uh, Dinez Smith's work and, and they are one of my favorite, if not my favorite uh, new poet. I still think they're new. Um, and uh, so reading, reading a lot about concrete poetry right now, because uh, one of the books I'm treating in the article is Montana Ray's Guns and Butter, which are, are poems that are all uh, shaped like pistols and have these parentheticals that, that operate in, in a number of, of, of suggestive ways, I think. But um, I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Justin Weimer, his book Deed that came out last year is, is gorgeous, uh, uh, and it's he's a West Virginia poet. Um, his his uh, he he identifies as an as a as an like an echo poet, uh, and echo poetics is his specialization. Uh, but it's it, it's a a kind of poetry that, and I think echo poetry is kind of queering things already. I think, uh, but it's kind of undoing what Cameron is talking about in terms of the structuring of our perceptions that are, are so deep, those assumptions and the ways that we see are so deep that we don't even know that we are guided in those ways. And I think that, uh, I think that those are, that his, his work is, is, is getting at some very hard to say. And it almost, it's almost as though he moves into the tactile um, of, of the natural world and its edge habitats, um, as well as the linguistic. Uh, I also, a very different kind of poet is William Brewer, his I Know You're Kind. Uh, my students just loved it. And I think felt like they were permitted to, to grieve and to heal also in its treatment of the opioid you know, you know, epidemic here that's affected just about everybody I know and in Fairmont and uh, all of my students in some ways, some in immediate and terrible ways and some uh, you know, less, less immediate, but nobody is untouched. Um, I, I go back to teaching Harriet Mullen's work pretty regularly too. Um, her uh, Sleeping with the Dictionary is just a, is a go-to for me. Uh, and the actual dictionary, Noah's Ark, the 1828 uh, <laughs> Webster's is just loaded with poetry. Uh, if I'm ever in a, stuck on one of those days and Linda Kinahan's waiting for her poem, I, I will go to the, to the dictionary and just see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great, that's great. Maria, do you want to uh, chime in here? Have we had questions from abroad? Sure, we, we have had a, a few questions um, and, and something that I'm going to uh, just ask everyone because we've been talking about uh, the works that you're currently reading and people are, are hoping to uh, have a list of those. So I'm going to ask uh, all of the authors here to send those to me in an email and what I'll do so everybody that's watching knows. Um, I'll be posting that on the event page on festivalcharleston.com's website so that everyone can can easily reference that. But 
in that in that same vein, um, where where can the the people who are watching this uh, both now and uh, the pre recorded that will be airing, where can they find uh, your works? Both uh, there was a specific question, Cameron, about your your article, but any of the things that you have published, um, where where can we direct people to find those? Sure. So the, the article um, that Mark mentioned is online uh, in the Pittsburgh uh, Tribune Review. Um, you should be able to just Google Cameron Barnett Pittsburgh Trib and it should pop up. Um, my book is through Autumn House Press here in Pittsburgh. Um, I think it's autumnhouse.org. You can find it there. Um, and I would recommend going there. It, it might be on Amazon or other places, but I, I believe right now Autumn House is also um, selling their collections by Black authors and donating the proceeds to various um, funds that are, are helping with social justice work in the world. So if you, if you want to get it, uh, get it from uh, Autumn House. Great, great. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, my small presses are don't sell on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Uh, if you go to my website, there are links to the presses. Um, my website is marybmorepoetry.com. And there are three books, Slicker. Oh, well, Mark mentioned those, I think, anyway. Um, and those are from, for those of you who don't know poetry, a lot of poetry in the United States is published by small presses run by volunteers. They do not sometimes have, usually, have money for marketing. They don't send out review copies. They do the best they can with uh, their limited resources. They're happy to and lucky to publish the books. And uh, that's kind of where it stops. <laughs> so you have to order the books from the press. Uh, you can actually order them from me too. Uh, so you can contact me through the, um, through the uh, website. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Elizabeth? Uh, my books are from Dancing Girl Press. That's the, my chaps, some of my, two of my chaps. And everything else is from uh, Furniture Press Books. Uh, like everything, you can usually find things on Amazon or you know sellers on um, on the Google. But uh, and I have I've often had uh, people just ask me if I had copies. I'm really low right now, so the presses would probably be good. I'm I'm starting a website soon that will have all of that information and those links. And I'd I'd like to say too that as Mary was saying, these presses are small. There are volunteers who do a lot of other things and you really have to be patient. Uh, you may not get your order for a while and you may have to remind them a couple of times too. Uh, <laughs> it's not because they're incompetent. It's not because it's because they're doing, you know, they're doing the Lord's work and <laughs> they, they have children and regular jobs and, you know, all kinds of other things too. So, um, I just want to throw that out there because I know it can be it can be frustrating sometimes. Thanks for saying that, Elizabeth. I was so intent on communicating the difficulty of it. But you're right. Their work is an act of devotion. And many of them are also working full time at jobs. They have children. Right now, everything is messed up anyway because they're home with their kids. And so thanks. Oh, Jim. Thank you. Jim. Um, I mean, I would, yeah, unfortunately, they're all on Amazon, but <laughs> I mean, Amazon is, you know, an evil entity, but they do sell all our books, or at least most of them. Um, I think my press, Carnegie Mellon University Press, is distributed by University of Chicago Press, so it's really easy to get books directly from them, um, but you won't get the discount. So it's, it's yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything really to add. It's difficult. Um, these days, there are lots of indie distributors popping up, and let's hope that they work out because it would be nice to be able to compete, you know, with Amazon. Yeah. Sure. And and I think all of us would testify that the smaller independent publishers were really crucial in our earlier years. Certainly, you know, uh, 
give thanks for the people that ran the small chapbook presses that brought out my first books. As for my own, um, yes, I think most can be found on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, but I always like to give a shout out to the West Virginia okay. Book Company here in West Virginia, who's been kind enough to carry many of my books and many of the books of West Virginia and Appalachian authors throughout the years. Uh, Maria, um, another question to squeeze in. I, I could also just ask everybody to give a quick uh, point if anybody has any new book coming out that they want to mention, but I also want to uh, give it back to you, Maria. Sure. Uh, well, we'll ask um, uh, two quick questions because one pertains to, to another thing I'd like to, to mention about festival. Um, but just a general question to to all of you is is how the delivery of your work is changing now that this is, you know, you're essentially presenting visibly to the six of us that are here, but there are so many other people beyond the screen. And when you're in person, reading your poetry or, or taking readings, you, you get to feed off of the people who are right there in front of you. How has this shift in format changed the way that you deliver your work right now? I'll speak for a change uh, and let the others follow up that will. It, I really miss the face to face. It's, um, I don't think I'm the same person speaking to the screen, even with the six lovely faces I have in front of me now, it's still just not quite the, the same. I, 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 I can, I just, there's an energy that runs through a real audience, a human energy. And I swear I connect with that. And I, and I do miss that. On the other hand, don't get me wrong. I'm really grateful that we're able to do what we're doing virtually and, and to, to save something so wonderful as the festival um, activities that come out of Charleston, West Virginia. But uh, I do miss the other. And I'll shut up I'll, somebody else. I'll just say I, I feel the same as Mark. I, I definitely miss the in-person readings, although maybe I don't miss that, that pre-reading anxiety in your stomach. Um, <laughs> but but for all the people watching out there, um, I give you all the benefit of the doubt. And what I do is I assume that you all are whatever previous best audience I've read in front of, and I'm just doing it again. And so I try to read as if you're all out there just like, woo, and maybe yes. you're not, and maybe you are, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> good, good, good. Martha, I know what you mean about that, that human energy. I, I noticed it first in, um, you know, when, when classes had to go all online and we didn't realize how even just sitting and thinking about a question in the same room, not even saying anything was part of our, our ways of reading poetry together. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first time I've, I've done a poetry reading since all this happened. Uh, and, but I've had a lot of meetings and I don't know, I'm not sure there's some benefits to it. Like you said, like the, the nerves are a little bit less, I think. Um, but I, I, I do miss, that's the whole point of writing this, writing is, is to, be in, to be in the room with other people and wanting to talk about poetry. Um, but this has been a, a nice antidote to, <laughs> to, the, to the loss of the live, the live gathering. Um, and I've, I've loved this. Thank you so much for including me in this. Um, this You're very is, welcome. It's even better than I imagined. Good, good, good. Um, I too miss the live audience, but I enjoy the fact that you've initiated discussions amongst us. That's been really nice. Um, I think I probably get kind of intense, but especially intense when I'm reading in the, in the moment of reading. Um, and I tend to get intense anyway, but I, I do think it's probably um, more so because I'm worried about communicating when I can't see people <laughs> and feel their, you know, you feel response. Sure, sure. Jim? Well, unfortunately, this has all just reinforced my inherent reclusive nature, so. <laughs> I'll be honest, it hasn't been all that bad, um, except for the actual reality of the world and what people are going through, obviously. But I'm, I always, I felt for the last few years that I'm sort of done with readings. They don't quite float my boat the way they used to, but then when I do them, I always really enjoy them. So I'm just being difficult. Um, 
And obviously the biggest benefit is something like today where you meet new friends and you get to share in this thing that is so important to us um, and which is surprisingly becoming, and from my historical perspective, I, poetry is blowing up in ways that are really wonderful. It's, it's um, the audience is growing, the access to it is growing. It's just a really, really wonderful time for poetry. So it's nice to be able to participate it even if I do tend to just want to stay home. <laughs> oh, those are just the words maybe we need, Maria, to, to wind this up, do you think? Yep, absolutely. Uh, so that was a, those were good words, Jim, that um, poetry is, um, is important and good for us all, even if we tend to want to be hermits sometimes. <laughs> and I am one of those as well. Maria? Sure, I, I have one uh, quick request of everyone that's watching here today. I'm going to drop a link into the chat. That is a uh, survey from the West Virginia Humanities Council that we would greatly that's appreciate uh, your that's feedback nice. from this program as they are uh, a fiscal agent and would like to hear from, from everyone who participated and uh, festival thrives on, on collaboration and feedback. So we always appreciate hearing um, what you what you liked, what you'd like to see at future festivals, um, potentially different themes for the authors roundtable, uh, as this is an annual festival event. So I'm getting ready to drop that in, uh, and would love to hear from from all of you. And uh, uh, another question that that popped up, but it relates to what I'm about to share as well, is that we do have another poetry uh, component of festival virtual, which is happening this uh, Friday, June 26th, and. Um, it is called Poems While You Wait. This is uh, an event that's traditionally happened on the Saturday of festival, um, put on again by Mark. And uh, he will be taking requests, the first 30 requests. It opens up at 4 p.m. on Friday the 26th. And instead of uh, seeing Mark furiously type away on an old fashioned typewriter in front of you, he's promised to uh, send you a poem within 48 hours of receipt request. He's uh, selected a couple themes that you can choose from and uh, we'll be sending them directly to, to the, the inbox of the people who request it. So that is happening Friday. And uh, I'll ask this question while I work to get Mark back on the line here. Um, in that same vein, what is the fastest that you've ever written a poem? <laughs> I I think I wrote one in about 10 minutes and just to see I sent it out right away to see and it and it was taken. <laughs> so wow. that was in response to a really an email that got me just got me charged up. So I wrote it as a response to another poet friend who was talking about her son. Um but that's that does not happen other than that one time. So. Well, I'll, yeah. respond, I'll respond by saying that once a poem took me 20 years and oh. it won a prize at the end of 20 years. Of course, I didn't work on it continuously for 20 years. <laughs> I started it and left it alone, went back to it. And then I left it alone for many years and went back to it and saw Oh, the main story isn't there and put it in and sent it out and it didn't win a prize but it placed at terrain.org which is one of my favorite places so writing one fast I imagine that would be like an hour for me and then it would still probably undergo revision so oh, I don't know what I'm saying I, I host um or I'm one of the founders of the Haiku Deathmatch at uh, Fairmont State <laughs> here, and and we have to write uh, a haiku in 90 seconds. Um, <laughs> we have to do this 10 times. And it's you know contestants, and I'm a, a two not to brag, but a two-time Haiku Deathmatch <laughs> champion. So, so you set the bar, and then you. So set yeah, it so really, it's like you know, probably more like 45 seconds is the shortest. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. I'll, I'll put a little twist on it too and say my fastest is definitely under 
20, maybe 30 minutes. Um, but I would also say, I, I think that's my optimal time for like writing. And I'll, I'll say this because I have a summer workshop group uh, that was begun in grad school. And we kind of realized that like the academic workshop can tend to be very brutal um, and it has its purpose, but uh, yeah. we wanted a more generative space. Yeah. And so in the summer we would meet on weekends and we set a timer. It's one hour thing. We bring a prompt, we bring a poem. Sometimes they're connected and we share that out and everyone just has you know, material to work with. And uh, at least five of my favorite poems in The Drowning Boy's Guide to Water um, came from those. Um, and I'm talking about poems that uh, maybe much like Elizabeth, very minimal editing, um, you know, I just happened to be locked into a, a great 20 minutes in history <laughs> for myself. Um, yeah. Cool. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I think poems can be written instantly. I mean, the best, one of the best poets who ever lived was Frank O'Hara and he claims to have written most of his poems on his lunch hour. And I, and I tend to believe him. So, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, yeah, most poems take a couple of weeks to a month and maybe even more, but sometimes you get it quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you, watching Mark and uh, he always has a, a guest poet with him, just do their, do their work so quickly. And it's, it's very, uh, it's very impressive and under, to do so under such duress with someone standing there watching you <laughs> try to, yeah. try to turn one out. It's, it's impressive. Um, but I, I'm not sh quite sure that we're going to be able to get Mark back on. He is he is actively working, but wanted to pass along his genuine and heartfelt thanks and and mine as well to each each of you for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Jim, Mary, Elizabeth, and and Cameron. Appreciate you so much sharing your works. Off uh, so many new pieces too. Uh, we're very very appreciative uh, of that and just for your time and your words. And I hope that. Um, everyone watching has really enjoyed it and you can please feel free to go back and look through the feed. I encourage you to do that because uh, overwhelming just support and, and really kind. kind. How do we access that feed? So if I'll send you the link as well and Mark is hopping back on too, okay. um, but you can go to the Festival Charleston YouTube page and this recording will be housed there for the duration of Festival. So even uh, those of you, if you out there watching, if you have friends, family, um, colleagues that were unable to watch, this will be available on the Festival YouTube channel through the, the end of next Sunday, the final day of Festival. Um, so we encourage you to, to share that. And again, just thank you all for, uh, for your time today and for, for sharing your works. And Mark, I don't know if you have any additional um, no, closing sorry, statements I, to make. Sorry, but I blanked out there. I apparently threw <laughs> myself away. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, thank oh, you Marie. Thanks, you. Festival. Thank you, poets. Goodbye. <laughs> Marie, could you tell what I wondered when I asked about accessing the feed was how to access people's comments. You said there were.